was saying, it's a great honor to be here. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. I am Blue Teepee Woman, and I'm a co-founder of Indigenous Peoples Day. So we welcome you with our whole hearts. There's many people here that make up our Indigenous Peoples Day Montana, including Extreme History Project, Crystal Allegra, and Marsha Fulton, who is the other co-founder of Indigenous Peoples Day. But we would like to thank you. And we would like to thank Native Lands Project for allowing us this honor to appreciate Louise Gobel. Without further ado, I would like to introduce one of the people that always has my back, our back, that always stands a voice, a reason, cool, calm, never judgmental, always with the guiding hand. His name is Walsasik, and it means light laying down. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce the Department Head of Native American Studies, Dr. Walter Fleming. Thank you. Uh, it's my honor to be here tonight as one of the co-sponsors and to welcome you on behalf of, of the, the Department of Native American Studies, one of several uh, sponsors, as you've heard. Um, <clears throat> Fifty years ago, when Eloise Cobell decided to leave Montana State University to return home to care for her ailing mother, uh, she didn't return to finish her degree. And when she was here, she was one of a handful of students um, that were studying here at MSU, uh, perhaps as few as a dozen. And so she, even then, she was a trailbreaker. Even though she did not receive the degree that we so prize in some cultures, her decision to return home was no doubt difficult, but probably made easy to know that she was going home to care for her mother. She probably could have found somebody, the family no doubt could have found somebody to, to uh, care for her, and she could have stayed, but she felt she had a responsibility a responsibility to care for those who couldn't care for themselves. And so it's especially an honor tonight to recognize that responsibility, but also to recognize that we have also a responsibility. From that handful of students that were here in the late 60s, today, 2017, there are 712 native students at Montana State University. In the last three years, uh, we have graduated uh, more than 100 students each, each year who have gone on with their doctorates, with their masters, with their bachelors, with certificates. And if Eloise could see that, and certainly, uh, she did see much of that. Uh, I'm sure she would have been proud. Because education, I think, was extremely important, even though she didn't have that degree from MSU that so many of us covet. We, we, we took care of that. Uh, Native American Study was very proud to advance her name to receive an honorary doctorate in 2002. And so Dr. Uh, Eloise Cobell is uh, among us. Her interest in education is uh, replicated in the, in the settlement. And as a result of the settlement, uh, there was a, a scholarship program established. And that scholarship program, the, the Cobell scholarships, uh, have allowed students to go to school, receive funding uh, to do so. And, and we no doubt have some uh, Hope Cobell scholars here tonight. And so if you are here, could you stand up and be acknowledged? <laughs> and 
And so it is with that pride that Native American Studies is, is um, fortunate to be allowed the, the honor and the responsibility to keep the legacy of Eloise Cobell alive so that we, we never forget the sacrifice that she made, the sacrifice to return home, and the sacrifice to enter into a long journey uh, which um, has not ended yet and did not end with her death. Uh, I, we're very fortunate in NAS to have some really uh, important uh, thinky, thinkers in our, in our midst, and, and certainly um, uh, the faculty are here, and, and we're, we're honored that they came. But I want to recognize and introduce uh, one um, person who's been very active in today's activities, uh, Dr. Kristen Ruppel who's been trained in, in a number of areas in anthropology and biology. She has um, uh, um, worked in ethnobotany, uh, but um, the consequence of her work in Indian land tenure uh, led to the publication of her book, uh, it, her first book. I say that because now it pressures her to write many, many more. Uh, so her first book was um, titled Unearthing Indian Land, Living with the Legacy of Lotment. And so she knows very much uh, the story of Eloise Cabell. And it's my pleasure to introduce her, who will then um, introduce the, the program that we have scheduled tonight. And so thank you very much for coming. It's an incredible crowd. Um, we won't tell the fire marshal, uh, but there are seats down here if uh, those up uh, in the rafters would like to come down. And again, uh, thank you for coming. Um, I would like to start just by recognizing you. <laughs> this is an incredible crowd, a beautiful crowd, and I, um, I really do appreciate your coming out for this and having the, the interest in this subject to, to really come and um, for something that is, uh, we hope is gonna be a, a fun evening, but also educational. Um, and so there will be a, uh, I will introduce a, a, a speaker uh, who's gonna then introduce the film, who is closer to it and to me, I mean to uh, Eloise Cobell than I uh, ever was. Um, and I'll talk about that in just a second. And then, uh, uh, and then after the film, please don't leave because we have invited a, a panel of Blackfeet uh, thinkers and leaders and experts in their own right uh, to come and, and speak about uh, Eloise and about the ways in which she inspired their work, which is ongoing. Um, and so that's what I'm really looking forward to. I've seen the film and I think it's a beautiful film. And uh, I'm really looking forward also though to hearing what the panel discussants have to say because I never got to meet Eloise Cobell. Um, I spoke with her on the phone a couple of times when I was doing my research and um, that was a, quite a while ago and the litigation was in full swing and so I just never, I got to meet a, a, a number of the, the women who were uh, warriors alongside her and uh, so I got the sort of vicarious thrill of knowing her that way and, uh, and that thrill continues um, tonight and so I, um, I hope that you share in that thrill. Uh, the next thing I'd like to do is uh, ask uh, Jim Scott to come down and say a few words about his relationship with Eloise Cobell. Jim is one of our supporters and uh, a person who, um, without whom this evening probably couldn't have happened. And, and he did know Eloise well, and so I'd like to recognize him and thank him for his support for, for this project and, the, and the, the larger project, the Native Land Project that, uh, that, in, that, it, that is around it. So thank you, Jim. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kristen, and thank you, Walter, and thanks to the singers and drummers for that wonderful opening. I'm really honored to be here tonight and to speak to you, and very happy to have a chance to see 100 years again. I've seen it once myself. Uh, you can read uh, Eloise's 
uh, words and you can read about her. And, um, but to hear her voice, she had the most, she was the best orator I think I ever knew. And uh, the shape of her words and, uh, are wonderful. You're in for a treat. The Crow people have a way of describing how lives connect in family or in community. And they say it's as driftwood lodges, as driftwood comes together on the bank of a river and comes, becomes one in structure that's enduring. My life uh, lodged with Eloise's in the early 90s when we were both on the board of the Montana Community Foundation. And my memory was that Eloise got there first but I did some fact checking today and I actually was wrong. I was there first. But uh, that memory lapse proves the point that things didn't really start until Eloise showed up. <laughs> I knew Eloise by reputation before the meeting, before meeting her. She was the Blackfeet tribal treasurer who when in 1987 the local bank went broke uh, after trying to get others to reopen the bank, had the vision and gumption to convince the tribe to charter the first tribally owned bank in the country. She understood how important a community bank is and wouldn't take no for an answer. Our friendship was based on that common interest. She went, I work with First Interstate, she went on the First Interstate board in 1993 where she continued to be a director until 2009. Among other things, she inspired First Interstate to replicate a program that she had founded at the Blackfeet Bank called the Mini Bank Program. That's where children in grade school and secondary school come together and create their own bank. Today, as we speak, there are 1,200 elementary and secondary students uh, in 22 low and moderate income schools around First Interstate country, uh, many on reservations, participating in managing their own bank learning financial literacy and benefit and the benefit of savings. That one program that Eloise inspired has probably touched well over 10,000 children since she helped found it. It's just one of the many examples of how Eloise changed lives. We also shared a deep love of our landscape and for conservation. My wife Chris and I in the late 80s had become involved with the Montana Nature Conservancy and that was just when the Conservancy was learning that conservation in the West was more than protecting a small place where there's a rare plant or animal, and it's more than racing the other land trust to the next donor where you can get a conservation easement or a donation. It had to do with protecting large, precious, intact, uh, intact landscapes, working with both private owners and interests and public uh, and to, to protect those timeless and precious places. Of prime importance was what was called the crown of the continent, ecosystem. Millions of acres in Montana and Canada, bounded from Highway 200 on the south between Ovando and Lincoln to Crow's Nest Pass in the north where British Columbia and Alberta come together um, from the Flathead Valley in the west and, and uh, the front range of the Rockies in the east. On ecosystem maps right in the middle of that country, that beautiful country was the Blackfeet Reservation. The Nature Conservancy had done some work in the past with the Blackfeet people, but we were thrilled uh, when in 1998 Eloise came on the board. Eloise loved the idea of a private land trust, not bound by government bureaucracy and nimble enough to move when opportunities arrived she was so inspired that she decided to found the first Native American land trust, the Blackfeet Indian Conservation Land Trust, and that was founded in 1999. With the support of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Agency and the and Nature Conservancy, the Blackfeet Indian Conservation Land Trust was able to purchase a ranch owned by the sculptor Bob Scriver west of Browning. Eloise's vision and that of the land trust was one, to buy or obtain land on the reservation that had gone out of trust and either through buying it or, or, or getting a conservation easement, managing it uh, for, to, to protect it uh, for the benefit of the Blackfeet people and to manage it in a way that demonstrated best conservation practices 
inc including sustaining human life in that landscape. The Blackfeet Land Trust engaged tribal leaders, the community college, students and adults from both on and off the reservation. Like everything else she was involved in, Eloise was the visionary leader who provided the inspiration, energy, and refusal to take no for an answer. The Blackfeet Indian Land Trust exists today and, and like its founder, has been a catalyst for many of the great things that we'll hear after the movie. During the years I knew Eloise, I got to see her as a philanthropist, as a mother of a son who she was so proud of, and the wife of a man she dearly loved and gave him one of her kidneys when he needed it. Starting in 1996 and lasting for the next 13 years, his life her life became consumed by the issue we're going to see about in the movie. I had the pr profound privilege to speak at Eloise's ceremony in, in her funeral, and my feelings have not changed. Eloise gave all of us the greatest gift that one can give, inspiration. Eloise inspired because of four qualities she had in great depth. Added together, they made her a world changer. The first was vision. She had the ability to see the big picture, to understand connectedness, to see root cause, not just the surface. The next is courage. She understood that the difference between right and wrong and knew that right was not usually the easy way or the painless way. She was a warrior and was willing to pay any price to do right. The third is determination. A good friend who's also here tonight said that Eloise was the head of the Wolverine Club. If you get into a fight with a Wolverine, you better be ready to last for a long time. Now, Eloise had the stamina of a Wolverine. And the last is joy. One of the great stories I remember, I didn't ever knew Eloise as a little girl, but she would talk about when she would go to Great Falls back to Browning in the car with her girlfriends. They'd slam on the brakes someplace probably around Shoto and do the Chinese fire drill and get back in the car. <laughs> Eloise had a twinkle in her eye. She had a sense of joy that kept her going and was infectious. Living life wasn't easy, but a laugh was never ever far, far away. She found joy in many things, including this great place that we live in, helping people and their family. It's a pleasure to be here. I know you're going to enjoy this movie. Thank you.
the memory of Al Ruiz who can share the memory. And hopefully that it inspires us to do something great with our lives, to do something great to influence the next generation so that they can have a beautiful place to live. I hope. Everybody hear me? Great. Um, yeah, can the, can the panelists just come up and I'll have you introduce yourself. But while they're coming down, um, um, just briefly, I'd like to just tell a quick story about um, how I relate to this, to this program um, t and to, to this panel. Um, so like Kristen said, my name is Avery Old Coyote. Um, my crow name is Ipche Bachba, means uh, medicine pipe. <clears throat> Um, and so, I, I actually, you're probably wondering, why is there a crow on this panel? Well, I, uh, I thought the same thing, and so I, I actually um, did some research into uh, my own family history. I had um, a couple documents that, um, of Eloise's um, family tree, and I actually found out just yesterday that I'm related to her. So, um, yeah, it's pretty cool. I'm, I'm excited. So, my... Uh, my the original old coyote, uh, my great great grandfather, his grandpa was um, mountain chief, so came from that same bloodline. But oh, you guys want to pass me that? Those papers. So that's just briefly um, about me, and um, I, w I just really want to um, start a conversation um, with the panelists and also with you guys. Um, not so much about the, the litigation that, the, you know, the lawsuits and the settlements, but about Eloise Cabal, about um, Yellow Bird Woman. And so, um, if you would, panelists, please introduce yourself, and then um, either in, in your introduction, um, or after, should we do after the get going? Yeah, so just introduce yourself, please. Okay. <laughs> uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome. 
Uh, my name is Mark McGee. I'm the director of the land department for the Blackfeet tribe. Okay. Um, my name is Helen Carlson. I'm the co-founder of the Native Science Field Center at Blackfeet Community College. Okay, in the study Donaku, my stosuatsis, um, Blackfeet name is Crow Tail Feathers, and uh, going back to Avery's comment, a band of the Mskapi Bikani from our tribe did frequent this area called the Small Robes. And so that's where a lot of the relationships come from. I just wanted to share that with you. And I'm the vice chairman of the Blackfeet tribe and also a good friend of Eloise and her family. And my name is Lauren bird -Rattler. I work for the Blackfeet tribe as well. I was Eloise's neighbor. Um, I, w I played basketball with her son. Um, she was very close to our family. And, um, and so I worked with her um, in other professional capacities as well. Lauren, I guess we'll just start with you. Um, so, um, it was a really emotional film, and I almost think they should have called it 100 Tears than 100 Years, but is there, I mean, there has to be some sort of um, you know, personal connection that you, that you guys made. Obviously, you guys all know her. Um, did it bring up any sort of um, stories that you'd like to share? Um, also, what, what is the legacy of um, Yellow Bird Woman, and how does that legacy affect <laughs> Certainly, well, um, Eloise uh, affected all of us in many ways, I think, um, when we think about um, uh, her impact that she had on us. Um, on a personal level, um, she um, would call me, I was living in Washington, D.C. at the time, and so she would call me and ask me to help her um, get Indians into the courtroom so that, um, so that they knew that we um, were well represented despite um, very few Indians actually living in Washington, D.C. And so. Um, she was also on the uh, board of directors while I was at the National Museum of the American Indian, and so she would routinely call on me to do um, certain things um, during the lawsuit. Um, I think that uh, what, one of my more fond memories, um, and something that I'm very proud of, uh, you know, in terms of um, uh, of her legacy, was um, actually happened at my family's camp, and it was in the the um, the movie um, <coughs> um, when they're um, at Harbute Indian Days. And so I was working for the Montana Democratic Party at the time and doing Indian outreach for the Democrats. And, um, and so I kind of went uh, against um, probably ethical rules a little bit and, and let her know that uh, Senator Tester was going to be at Hart Butte. And so, um, so she um, showed up. I didn't realize that she was actually going to have her film crew. And so um, when they get to my family's camp, she um, <clears throat> come out of the teepee as we were coming up to introduce Senator Tester to my family, and she asked Senator Tester um, how he felt about the Cabal litigation. Um, of course, at this time it was State Senator Tester um, as he was running, and so um, uh, the 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 lady that was staffing him was Anna Whiting Sorrell from CSKT, and so she tried to very quickly, you know, divert the question, and he said, "No, I really want to answer this." He said, um, if I'm elected to the United States Senate, I will do everything in my power to, to settle this lawsuit. I think the United States uh, government's um, behavior is egregious, and, um, and I think that um, uh, Native Americans deserve justice. And so um, uh, on election night, um, uh, you know, I, I, um, <clears throat> we were waiting for the results of that, um, that election, and it was the very last race to come in. And so you also saw when Senator um, uh, McCain was the, uh, chairman of the Indian Affairs Committee, and so we were working very hard to flip that, to, to flip that, and so we knew that if we got control of the Senate, that we'd actually have a Democrat um, in that, in that, as the chair of the Indian Affairs Committee, that we'd probably uh, have a little more momentum in terms of the settlement of that lawsuit, and so that was one of the last races that came in because it was so close, and we had exceeded our goals um, in reservation precincts by 3,700 votes. And uh, Senator Tester um, won by 3,550, and so <laughs> we um, we not only flipped. <laughs> we not only flipped that Senate seat, you know, but um, but it also flipped the United States Senate and gave Democrat, uh, Democrats control of the Senate, and so um, so I remember that vividly that uh, that. Um, 
conversation in my family's camp, um, you know, though I did kind of go against the grain about what you really should do in, in campaigns, um, I, I was very proud of that moment. And so, um, so uh, when you think about her legacy, she had all of these foot soldiers, you know, in our community and in many Native communities that, that uh, carried out her work. And so when we think about her legacy, I think that, um, that the work that we continue to do in uh, conservation, in financial literacy, in arts and culture, and all of these um, projects that she started, um, it, it lives within the work that we do today. And, and that is what her legacy means to me. Yeah, I probably want to share something uh, that for me is very personal as far as my my relationship with uh, Eloise's uh, husband and her and her son. Um, and since the early 1970s, I was a uh, hunting partner of, of uh, Elv and her husband. And so I got to see Turk grow up. I got a little Turk grow up, as they say, uh, I called him then. Russell and, and so I got to see that very intimate family component. Uh, the, when I first got found out that Elvis could be very strict too, was I used to go over there and would, uh, with uh, Alvin Senior or Turk uh, Senior uh, and would cut meat, would make hamburger, would cut steaks and do all this thing, but we all stayed it out in the shed. And so I asked Turk, I said, well, why uh, don't we package some of this in the house because midwinter, January, February, he says, if we go in that house, we have to be very clean, Terry. We can't have nothing on us. And so, so anyway, we, before we got all the meat uh, cut, packaged, and wrapped, and we cleaned up, and then we went in the house, and Eloise usually had something cooked up for us. And so I got to see that part of it, that, that little uh, warrior in her uh, <laughs> before we walked in the house. But also on the, uh, the very, the mother that Eloise was to Turk Russell, um, I was sitting over there one time, it was about a week before Christmas, and Turk and I got through doing our thing, and Turk Russell just got into high school, at Blair High School, and, and so we were sitting there, and Eloise told, asked uh, old Turk, as I called him, <laughs> uh, let's uh, let little Turk Russell open one gift, and so, Anyway, he got to open one gift, and and, uh, and so he opened his uh, purple uh, Vler Panther shirt, uh, basically a coat. And and so I really, you know, that always kind of captured my memory for me as, as far as her relationship with her children, her husband, her family. So this past December, after I got on council, I was back in Washington, D.C., I was testifying to the Senate Committee on uh, Indian Affairs, along with Turk Russell, he was uh, actually testifying on the scholarship Cabell uh, program. And so before we testified in front of the, uh, the committee, I asked, I, I relayed the story to Turk Russell. I said, do you remember a long time ago when your mother allowed you to open that one gift? And uh, he said, yes, Terry, she'd let me do that up until I moved out of the house and became an adult, but when I went home, she still allowed me to open one gift prior to Christmas. And so that's something that was carried out, it was consistent, and so she had these routines, she had these ways, and she didn't weaken from them or deviate from them. So that was a personal story I wanted to share with you. On more on the professional, uh, and uh, as far as the lawsuit went, when I was uh, working at Blackfeet Community College in 1993, I developed a program in natural resource management incorporating Western science in our traditional knowledge. And at that time, Eloise in the, uh, was fully entrenched into the, to the lawsuit. And she knew I was teaching natural resources and, and working along with Mark and others from the tribe, uh, uh, educating our community on on resource management and some of the uh, inequities and injustices that had happened. So she said, Terry, um, she came in and uh, said, I'm going to Gonzaga, I'd like you to come along and we're gonna to talk to some classes about this uh, lawsuit. And so I went along with her, we went over there and, and she explained to the students at Gonzaga what the lawsuit was about, shared my stories about the teachings of the classes and what was going on in the community as far as the courses and how we were addressing some of that in our classes. 
So we, we got through with that, and then she, of course, had to go on to continue the battle. I was uh, teaching courses at BCC, along with uh, helping start a Blackfeet Conservation District. And she knew my interest in conservation, and I knew what she was doing with her lawsuit. So and uh, so we were out doing our thing for a number of years. And one time I had to fly back to DC for, for some, some reasons related to the college, and she was back there with the lawsuit. And I, we met up in, uh, in Salt Lake City, and I asked her where she's going. She, I told her to Bozeman. She asked me where I was going. I said to Bozeman. She said, what are you speaking on? I'm, I'm, told her I was speaking on uh, how to st establish in conservation districts on tribal lands to address some of the uh, challenges that we have in, in land management and land stewardship. And I asked her, what are you doing? And she said, oh, I'm going to go speak about the lawsuit to a another class. I said, we should just kind of uh, do a little uh, panel, basically, so that we can entertain both both uh, classes, but what didn't happen, but things were happening, the wheels were turning, and, and uh, it's just something that um, I knew she was very passionate about. She told me the detailed stories of the elders going into her office and showing these, uh, these payments, the inconsistent payments that she had been receiving, and, and just gave me that whole story behind it as a, as a friend, but as why we needed to continue this and, and uh, for me as in my capacity now as a as the vice chairman of our tribe we are dealing with uh, some of the uh, things that we need to continue as far as the the uh, the Cabell settlement goes uh, I keep in constant communication with Turk Russell on the on the scholarship I just actually uh, went and exchanged emails with him today and so her legacy lives on in, in conservation and education and, and that, um, that, for me, it's that intimate uh, feeling that she had for, for elders and her, her family and her, the, the, her loved ones and the young ones. So that's what I see her legacy is going across, all those, all those things. I guess um, thinking about this panel for a couple of weeks now and realizing I'm the only woman that's gonna speak tonight. <laughs> um, Eloise had, you know, she's inspired many of us, um, especially Native women. And um, for me is realizing this, the systemic change that she brings to all tribes and with her battle with the BIA and us realizing that you know there is hope for all of us to have the courage that we need to push what we believe in and to also teach our children to be strong and push for what they know is right and so um, I guess my relationship with Eloise goes back to the land trust. Um, when I returned home from, from college um, in 2000, I was able to work with youth groups out at the land trust and um, we had water, native waters camps. I worked with Bonnie Satchitello Sawyer and we put on week long camps for the youth out there and realizing you know, um, conservation at that time, looking at how we um, take care of our land and our water, our resources, um, and helping to really put together programs that help our youth um, reconnect with our way of life and the things that we're taught through our culture and our language. Um, and that's really empowering to have the opportunity to see Eloise and her legacy um, with all of the things that she really pushed in our community for economic development, financial literacy. I remember when I first went to college, um, I came here to MSU Bozeman. I wanted to be a chemical engineer. and 
got a scholarship to actually go to school for that. But my year here made me realize that um, there was more that I needed to learn about my own people. And when I returned home, I reflected on growing up at home. My dad, he, he worked for the um, tribal credit program. And I grew up in that office. Um, and I, I've had many great mentors. Um, one of the first ones being Mark's, Mark's grandma, um, Lucille McKay. Um, and a lot of the women who worked in the BIA at that time, because the BIA and the, the tribal office were together at that time. And Eloise was the treasurer during those years. And being able to walk through those hallways and see these women who were, you know, they were so um, strong and just so smart, like you just wanted to be like them. And I remember um, sitting in Lucille's office and her talking to me all the time about, I would, drive, I would draw her pictures and she would talk to me about, you know, when you grow up, you're gonna go to college and you're gonna do this and you're gonna learn that and you're gonna meet people. And the encouragement that um, we provide to each other, I think that's, you know, even with Eloise, Eloise's legacy and looking back at the success of many of our Native women, it, it's not without um, the mentorship of, of the ones before us. And so even in the film, and in her story of the things that she's accomplished with the banks um, and conservation um, and the lawsuit. Um, it's really inspiring because even today in the work that we do at the Native Science Field Center, it's not without a team. And it's not without the mentors that have come through our lives to help us gain the knowledge and the courage to kind of step out of the box and do things that are innovative. And I really think the generation before us and before them, you know, they've really opened up a lot of doors. And now, like my children are going to be able to do the work that they need to do without fear. And I think that's a big thing for us as, as Native people in Begunny is you'll always hear the Blackfeet are first this, our first that. And that's really um, inspiring. And when I talk about systemic reform, looking to some of the work that we've done with um, at the Blackfeet Community College. Our tribal colleges are so important because that's really um, where we're empowered to reflect not only on our, our past, but also looking at how do we build a future. And the tribal colleges provide that hub in the community for our, our students to, to really create vision and to pursue, you know, their dreams. And <clears throat> when we were working with um, educational reform, it was um, a challenge because you, we function in these systems that have been brought to us with good intentions but not always do, do they um, work with what we believe in or how we um, understand the world as tribal people. And so we've learned to adapt to those systems. And change is really scary. It's scary for, for a lot of us. But um, I think, you know, to be able to challenge those systems and create 
new vision that empowers the next generation to carry on and, and change some of the hard things that you know aren't working um, is, is something that is real big for us and especially for, for women. That's, that's what we carry. That's what we carry forward because we look back and we understand that they gave everything for us to, to be prosperous. And you can see that in Eloise when she's talking about the people that she's representing. And it, it means a lot to um, try hard. Igakima. They tell us all the time, Igakima, try hard. Because you're not just trying hard for yourself, but there's so many people that um, you know you're representing. Your grandmothers have put so much into you to make sure that life continues on. And so um, those are some of my thoughts, I better pass it. <laughs> <laughs> Gosh, now I forgot the question. So, <laughs> so um, you know, my relationship with Eloise is really quite unique, I think, and I, and I think that everybody feels that way. Um, I'm actually related to Eloise, and I've known her since, you know, for all of my life. My, my, her and my dad were first cousins, and, and they grew up together. Um, and so, she, you know, she's always been a part of our family. Uh, I, I went to school in Bozeman here, and her, her brother, whom some of you may know, is the late Ernie Pepin, who was a, an artist, a handicapped artist, actually. And he painted from a wheelchair, and he painted with an electronic easel. And um, while I was here in Bozeman, I spent some time helping him, taking care of him, things like that. Um, and, and so he would always want to go home so I'd drive him home when I would go home and, and drop him off at Eloise's house and, and spend some time there and visit. Um, so, um, hey, so we're cousins. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I've known Eloise in, in a, you know, on, a, on a personal level for a long time. Um, on a professional level, you know, I, I've known Eloise since she was a treasurer at the tribe. I, I didn't work for the tribe then, but, it, but I knew her in that capacity. And um, as, I, as I began my work with the tribe, um, she was still involved in, in some way uh, with the finances of the tribe. <clears throat> when she started her lawsuit, <clears throat> you know, she would call every once in a while and, and ask for information and, and anything that I could, could help her with we would get, um, and, and so there was some limited involvement in the lawsuit. Um, it, it was a long lawsuit, and, and I know that she, you know, really gave her life for that. But what a lot of people don't know about that, I guess, is that, um, and everybody just sees that there was a settlement, and uh, part of that settlement was um, not only for, for uh, reimbursement to people that whose funds weren't accounted for, but it was a, it was a, a there was a settlement in there for uh, to purchase their land. And there was a 1.9 billion dollar portion of that settlement that was called the Indian Land Buyback Program. And so I had the privilege of administering that program for the Blackfeet Tribe. Um, and so through. Eloise's efforts and, and, and the settlement funds, um, the, the land buyback program purchased um, over $150 million of land on the Blackfeet Reservation, and that amounted to about 324,000 acres. So <clears throat> in that capacity, um, you know, that's my work with the lawsuit and that's my work with Eloise. Um, I'm also a member of the, the uh, Blackfeet Land Trust, um, uh, an organization that, that was Eloise's brainchild, and, and she held very, very near and dear to her heart and be, because her belief 
all along and all of that was was to protect the land, protect the land, protect the land. And that was really the basis of the of the land trust was to get the land back and, and, and protect it and keep it in its purest form. Um, so in, in my mind, um, uh, Eloise's legacy is, is going to be with the land. Because, you know, and, and I've, I've met some of those people that Eloise talked about that, that were waiting and waiting and, and were gone before the lawsuit was settled. I, I remember a dear old lady, um, Clara LaPlante, she would call me on a weekly basis, you know, what about, what's going to happen with my land? What's going to, what's going on with my land? Um, and she just wanted, she just wanted something done so that she could um, enjoy maybe a, a small financial uh, income prior to her death. And I actually remember the week that she died, she had called me about three times from the hospital. And it was really difficult to not be able to answer those questions for her and, and uh, help her. And so, um, you know, that, that was, I, I, I felt Eloise's pain, as, as I'm sure you all did in, that, in the movie, about the people that have gone that aren't able to be here. And, and there's going to be a lot of those people. And, and one day we won't be here, and, and, um, but what is always going to be here is the land. It will always be here, and it will always belong to whoever is here. Um, it will always belong to the Blackfeet people or the Crow people, or, or uh, it'll be Mother Earth forever, and f and forever um, Eloise's name will be associated with that. So to me, that's Eloise's legacy. Thank you for those stories, panel. That was great. Um, I just want to ask a really important question. I'm sure many of you are thinking, um, what would Eloise have said about President Trump? I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, I don't want to take up too much, too, too many people's time. So um, if, if, any, if anyone has a question, I just want to open it up to the audience and so we can facilitate that conversation. If we don't have any questions, I got a whole page of questions. So. <laughs> Oh, yes. I'm just wondering how was that um, settlement broken out? I mean, the land trust piece, I mean, there was individual payments. Um, how did that look after all? Did a lot of it go back? So the, the biggest portion of that was distributed to tribal members nationwide. Um, if, if you held an IIM account at the time, um, then you were eligible for payment and, and so some people were paid based on uh, there, there was actually two payments some people were paid based on uh, the number of acres that they still held and, and um, the, the percentage of funds that were still being administered for them and then there was just a flat payment that, that went out nationwide to everybody the other portion of that, of course, was the, the land buyback funds, and that was $1.9 million. Interestingly enough, um, of the $1.9 billion, the United States government was awarded 15% for administration. <laughs> so, they got, so they got $285 million to administer something that they screwed up in the first place. So, um, and, and because it was a... Because it was a court settlement, the only way to change that was to go back to court, and, and that had just been going on too long. So it was just something that was accepted. So. You know, the, the interesting thing about that was that, um, and she talked about that when the when the when the uh, the guy hacked into their system and, and they basically had to shut down the government. Um, the federal government since then has spent uh, millions and millions of dollars on a new accounting system. It's called TAMS. It's, it stands for Trust Asset Accounting Management System. And it's a system that was developed by a private enterprise specifically for um, the Bureau of Indian Affairs to manage trust funds. So yeah, it's gotten a lot better. Um, it's gotten a lot better, but at the same time, you know, in addition to 
the, the lawsuit funds that there's been millions of dollars spent in just developing that system. Um, I remember when the government was shut down, uh, we would have people calling the tribe saying, I can't get any information, I can't get any information. So I would call the, the BIA and say, what's going on? Why can't these people get any service? And they'd all, the, the answer would always be, call your cousin Eloise. So. <laughs> Do you want to add? Do you want to add something? No? Oh. <laughs> any other? Any other questions? Oh. I think um, too with the with the land buyback. I know at home, um, it's it's a sense of security for our people um, because we know like understanding the fractionation of lands and how it was so hard to work through maneuvering how those payments were very little because there were so many people on one one parcel. Um, but now I think with the buyback and the tribe having more, um, being able to oversee that, it takes away some of the fear that our people used to say, well, the government's just gonna come in here and do away with the reservation. Well, now we're pretty much at ease that we don't have to be afraid of that because it's it's our land and we'll always have the say over over the land. <clears throat> um, that that last portion of that um, that settlement, the one point nine billion dollars, it was um, uh, Eloise had filed the lawsuit on behalf of individual Indian money account holders. And so that money was then utilized to purchase fractionated interests and, and give them over to the tribe. And so um, one of the things that she wanted to ensure um, during that time was was financial literacy and um, and you know financial literacy around large cash infusions that go into um, <clears throat> into tribes. Um, to you know when she had mentioned in the movie that um, uh, uh, banking was an integral part of. of financial management in our communities, but yet uh, we lacked it in Indian communities. And so um, one of the things that she had asked me to work on um, before the lawsuit was uh, finished was actually to do something around financial literacy for the distribution of those, um, of those funds. And so they came in three separate pieces. And the first one was um, distributed equally among the class proportionately. The second one was based on the value of your account or the value of your, the land that you had. And then the third one was for the land buyback. And unfortunately, we weren't able to actually get um, financial literacy in place until the third one. And so I was very happy to work very closely with Mark. And, uh, and we were the first tribe to actually offer a financial literacy campaign around um, uh, the distribution of those uh, that $150 million. And so we um, created a campaign um, that was um, underwritten by the Blackfeet tribe, as well as um, uh, First Interstate Bank and a few other funders um, that allowed us to actually create a public relations campaign in our community to infuse financial literacy in anticipation of those um, uh, cash payouts. And so that was one of the two directives that she gave me. The other one was, um, was to actually create a, um, a collections policy for her brother Ernie's art. Um, today that art is um, at the Blackfeet Heritage Center and so that's one of the things that I have left on my list that I still have to get done. But I'm, but I'm very happy to, um, to carry out those directives in her name um, as she had requested them before she was sick. Any question? I guess I, I'll take that one. Uh, one of the the uh, question is since the acquisition of uh, increased property that goes into the basically under the tribal governance management, tribal governance ownership, what is the plan for that land basically? And <clears throat> one of the things that we're working on right now, uh, working with Mark and other the tribal 
program directors that have any relationship in, in practice and land uses is we we are initiating effort to do a comprehensive land use plan for the Blackfeet Nation. And we've met with uh, the first stakeholders I had at the table was our, our tribal program directors. We've met with uh, that stakeholder group. We've met with and this, that we did that in November of 2016. We held um, more stakeholder meetings in May involving the, uh, the landowners, the egg producers, uh, and also with the elders, the youth, and all those different uh, interests of, that utilize our land base on the reservation. And once we get, compile that data and, and uh, recommendations from those uh, initial stakeholder meetings, we'll start looking at the policies, working with Lauren, he's working on another project, the Ag Resource Management Plan, how we're going to look at um, maintaining uh, uh, some of the agriculture productive lands, yet looking at the areas of conservation, important habitat, areas of community growth and development. So that's gonna be what's uh, going into this land use plan that uh, we're actually uh, just in the initial stages of that. We hope to have that uh, final draft out by the, by the fall of 2018 and for public review, and, and then once we get public comment on that, then it'll become the policies that drive the land use uh, on, the, on the Blackfeet Reservation. But a lot of those things can change because we have elections next year, and you know, see how that dynamic plays into it. Um, I just wanted to share this. For, for the position I'm in on Tribal Council, there was a gentleman in the film that, um, is back with uh, Secretary Zinke, James Kaysen. And we know that we, we, we knew his position on the settlement. We looked at some of the things that have been said uh, since his new, uh, basically, appointment back in that position uh, based on the settlement. Um, and one of the things that we have to be really prepared and vigilant about now uh, is the the unknown. We don't know what that is. Is it going to be retaliation? Is it going to be support? We don't know how that's going to play out, but we got to be aware of all the things that could potentially uh, be, be the new uh, benefits from it or the new challenges of, of certain individuals and in certain positions that have a large influence on, on things that uh, we deal with on a, on a daily and on a future basis. Do you have time for one more question? Right there, yeah. Um, I was curious, um, the initial amount that was mentioned for the settlement in the early stage of the lawsuit was $27.5 million, but she always said that was kind of a low estimate or a low ball number. Just, is there any kind of an, uh, an estimated number of what the actual value of over that 100-year period, what the actual value of the Everybody's looking at me, so I guess I. Um, <laughs> I'll do a follow-up from a cultural perspective too. You know, honest, honestly, I, I, I don't think there is. I, I think that it was an impossible task to begin with, just because there were so many records that were destroyed, literally destroyed. I mean, you, you saw the in the film the, the the warehouses with with boxes and boxes, and that was nationwide. And some of those warehouses, you know, had leaky roofs, and and so the, the records got wet. Um, and uh, some of them burned. I mean, it was just impossible to to um, put together a, an accounting of of what that actual is actually is. So um, I, I think that really she felt that she was she was short um, with the 27 million or billion, excuse me. Um, but what that what that real figure is, it, it it'll just never be known. So. One of the things for us as tribal people is putting a monetary value on anything. Um, we, in our ways, we weren't given possession of anything. But the value 
in the the um, the value of the water, the value of the integrity of that land, the impact of ant to animals, all those things that we placed value on that wasn't monetary, didn't we can't come up with that number. And and not to mention the injustices to our people for when they by government action accepted these parcels and everything that went within them. It's really hard for us. Um, we are just stewards while we're here. We're stewards for those future users. And to put a monetary value on any of that is kind of beyond us in, in what our responsibility is to worry about. We want to make sure that we try our, to do our best to offer and, and, and give to the next generation what, we, what we've been able to enjoy and maintain that integrity of this place for people. I just want to thank everyone for coming tonight. If you'll stay for just one second longer. Um, oh, shoot. I want to do that. I wanted to do that. If you would copy down this Earl and go and fill out a very short survey, um, put it into your phone or something. It's just three, three questions. We'd like to get some feedback on tonight. And I'd really like to thank, once again, all of our panelists and Avery for doing the, the good job of moderating tonight. And, uh, and I hope everybody has a safe trip home.